Good amen, everyone. Take a seat. We're so thrilled that you are here today. What a great morning it's already been. I, I don't even feel like I need to get up here and say anything. Some of you are hoping I say very little so you can go on for the rest of your day. It's so wonderful to have a celebration like that. We are thrilled that you chose to join us here this morning as we are on this Palm Sunday continuing on a sermon series called Encountering Jesus that takes us all the way to Easter. want to say before I jump into my brief message here this morning, a reminder that this Friday is Good Friday. We will be having a service here at 1030. There will be food thereafter. We encourage you, your friends, the community, your neighbors, everyone and anyone is invited to be with us at 1030 this Friday. And then Easter Sunday morning, again, 1030 will be our service, but at 930 we're going to have breakfast here. And I hope you come with an appetite for both places. It's going to be a wonderful time for us as we zero in really on what the center of the Christian faith is all about. So if you're coming from the perspective of exploration, there's nothing better for you to discover what Christianity, Jesus, is all about, the church is all about, than celebrating this highlighted season for us. And if you have been a Christian, especially a long-time Christian, this is what it's all about, isn't it? This is the celebration. This is what it's, it all comes down to this event. Hey, I want to tell you a story. I am a big sports fan. Um, I am a big Colts fan, and as I study the history of the Colts, I grew up in uh, New Brunswick, but lived in Indianapolis for a period of years, so I followed the Indianapolis Colts, but before they were the Indianapolis Colts, they were the Baltimore Colts, and they had a great history, Johnny Unitas, some of the great championship title reigns before the NFL started, and there was this one defensive player who was well known on the team, his name was Eugene Big Daddy Lipscomb. He was a six-foot-six defensive lineman. He had a seven-foot wingspan. They said that when he wrapped people up, there was no getting out no matter what. And when he drove them to the ground, and you better believe he drove them to the ground hard, he was one of those rare guys who would actually extend his hand and help him back up and pat him on the back. This is the NFL of the 1960s and 70s where they didn't have the rules they do today. I mean, it, this was a rough sport, and yet, as big a man as he was, on the field, after a great play, he would help his opponents up. More than that, he would be seen after games signing autographs until the sun went down, and he could always be seen carrying children on his shoulders. That's plural, right? That's how big this guy was. He was known in his neighborhood in Baltimore of taking families that he knew were struggling and taking entire families to a department store so he could get the kids winter boots and winter jackets and some clothes for the new school year. There were occasions in which there would be derelicts outside of his apartment building that would be sleeping outside. He would go find them and he would bring them back inside to the house and let them have his bed. There was no question that <sighs> Eugene Big Daddy Lipscomb was a good man. At least that was one part of his life. If that was his Dr. Jekyll, his Mr. Hyde was the polar opposite. You see, Eugene had some issues that he struggled with and wrestled with all his life. His autobiography tells us that every night he would pull his giant bed in front of his door and he would sleep with a pistol underneath of his pillow because at night when the sun went down, for some reason he was terrified for a season, he borrowed his friend, giant Doberman Pinscher, and he chained him to the foot of his bed, so terrified was he. Friends, after a game, would be seen taking him out, and they would go to the bar, they would go to the pub, and Eugene wouldn't be celebrating. He'd be sitting off to the side, and when people went to look at him, they would see tears coming down his eyes, and when they asked him, what's the matter, he would just shake his head and say, the big daddy ain't all right, he's not all right. He lived with perpetual fear, and as you do a dive into his story, he suffered from abandonment and abuse issues growing up, and he was never able to shake those things. Those are not his fault. But some of the life choices he made thereafter would spiral his life completely out of control. See, to dull the pain, he was known to drink to excess. Every hotel room he went to in the last couple seasons of his playing career was completely trashed in the middle of the night. He was a drug addict. He frequented prostitutes around the city and around the different areas he lived in. In fact, we're told on the day of his death that he had gone to a friend's house. He had shot up with heroin twice when the coroner's office reported 
what had killed him. They found five times the amount of heroin that should kill a normal man in his body. He had already visited a number of prostitutes that very night. And what he left behind him were three ex-wives and a fiancé, the first of whom he married while engaged to the second. Meanwhile, the first one was impregnated with his child from the other experience. It just was this crazy story of a life that spiraled completely out of control. You see, you and I would hear a story like this. And we'd have no doubt that he wrestled with his own personal demons, right? We've heard that phrase a lot before wrestling with your own personal demons. It's something we can all attach to. We see people in their lives, and maybe they've had a hard life, or maybe they've gone up and down, left and right, and we look at them and some of the choices they make, and they seem to do well for a while, then they seem to go sideways, or they seem to always struggle with these different components of their day-to-day existence, and we would say what? They struggle, they, they wrestle with their own personal demons. But what does it mean for us to allow those things, those issues, those experiences, those choices to spiral us so far out of control that it leaves us fundamentally changed from who we were originally designed to be to being completely destroyed in the end? I'm going to say something that's going to be really hard for some of you to swallow here today. In the 21st century, in the Western world, People, by and large, but even Christians, have started to kind of move away from too much spiritual, too much evil. We can get behind God. We can even get behind this person named Jesus Christ. But when we talk about outside spiritual forces that, watch this, are actually actively looking to steal, kill, and destroy your person, we kind of look at that and we go, eh, We've got science now. Yeah, like we're too advanced for that stuff. We don't really believe in that, but let me tell you something. If you've ever gone to places around the world where the spiritual realm is not only believed but completely embraced, their experiences are very, very different. So my father-in-law travels all over the world doing missions. He has been to over 55 countries. He has told stories, and this is a man who grew up in Canada. He has told stories from experiences in different areas where spiritualism is embraced in a very dark manner that would make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. One of my professors who I went to school with, he is a PhD, okay? He's no dummy. He spent years overseas, and he has told stories that are straight out of movies, And so one of the things that I would propose to you today, as much as it is difficult for us to accept in this modern scientific and embracing world, and I'm very for science, and I believe in medicine, I believe all of those things, but what I'm saying is, is when we look at the issues that people struggle with, especially those of us who have or do struggle or wrestle with our own personal demons, even though that has become a phrase that we just use to describe difficulty, is there a possibility that behind all of that is something? Something that is trying to steal from you. Something that is trying to destroy you. Something that is trying to kill you at the source so that if it cannot ultimately destroy you, it can at least take something fundamental from your very person, that being your name. And so my question to you today is this. What's your name? What's your name? The sermon series we've been in called Encountering Jesus is all about questions that Jesus asks when he encountered people. I love the stories. See, we don't really look at it from this angle very often, but every time Jesus encountered someone, you will find these tendencies when he healed or he preached that very often what he will do when people approach him is he will ask them a question. And I don't know if you know this, but when you read the Bible, you're not meant to just read it as some religious or historical document that happened 2,000 years ago. No, 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 no. You're meant to enter into the scriptures. So when you read Jesus asking, probing questions, they're not just meant to be read as people from 2,000 years ago. They're probing you. And the question this morning he asks is one that is so key because so many of us have lost this reality of what our name is. I don't just mean what you were given as a title at birth. I mean what is your core identity? What is your person? Who are you? And who have you been declared? So let me set up the story for you, and here it is really quickly. 
of all the things God created in the universe, he is the great creator, the first cause. The Bible tells us in this universe, we are still seen as so much bigger and grander than we ever thought it would be. The Bible says the most precious, important thing he ever created was you. You are the only thing created in the image of God. That is something. That means your identity is core, established. You matter immensely, not only to God, but in the very scope of creation itself. But if we believe that there is this thing in the world called evil, and all you got to do is turn on the news, still happening. We still see stories. We just saw them last week. How can people do that? How can people sink to that? What causes someone to, oh, is it just chemical imbalance? I'm sure those are the realities there, but what's behind all of that? Where does evil come from? It comes, the Bible tells us, from a source whose purpose is to take the thing God cares about most, you, your person, and destroy it. He cannot defeat God. We don't believe in dualism. We don't do yin-yang. We, we don't have that in Christianity. God is all-powerful. He's the all-creator. So if he cannot defeat God, he will create the thing that matters most to him, and that is you. And so over and again throughout history, we see examples. Jesus encountered time after time people who were completely broken. Maybe it was because of their choices. We don't always know. But we know when he encountered people, so many of them were destroyed at the very source. And yet, he doesn't leave them there. And so here's the question for us today is, what's your name? Well, here's the story. It's Mark chapter 5, verse 1. Jesus has been traveling now. He has gathered disciples everywhere he goes. He's a mini celebrity. Crowds gather to hear him preach. They're wondering what he's going to say next. They're also wondering what he's going to do next. But this is one of the rare occasions he leaves Israel and he goes to a foreign land. It's a land that does not embrace Judaism. It does not practice any biblical values. It's actually a pagan land. And it's kind of funny, but he's going to show his disciples here something pretty profound and for those of us today, I think it is going to speak to who are, we are created to be and what our identity is. So here it is. Verse 1, it says, They went across the lake to the region of the Gerenines. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. The man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and he fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus has said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, For we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region as Jesus was getting into the boat. The man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away, began to tell in the Decapolis where he lived how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Church, what's your name? It was about seven years ago. I was pastor in the U.S., had just had a session with my pastors that I co-worked with. We were at a big church, so there's 13 of us, and I was bragging as the one Canadian in the room all the great things about Canada, talking about how wonderful it is, and it's just a socialist paradise. You should go check it out. And then I got this letter in the mail, literally that very day, and this is what it said. Dear borrower, we regret to inform you of the loss of a USB key containing the personal information of over 500,000 loan borrowers from the years of 2000 to 2006. If you had a Canada student loan during the period in which to inquire about the security of your records, please contact Canada Student Loans at blah, 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 blah. Maybe you remember the story. 
over a decade ago, someone in the government decided to take the personal information of all people who got a student loan between the years of 2000 and 2006 and put it on an external USB hard drive and that went missing. And so what this letter was beginning to inform me about was that the very real likelihood, and by the way, they've never found that key, prepare yourself, go buy the software. By the way, they didn't pay for it, they wanted me to, because your identity is about to be stolen. Man, I'm telling you, in the digital age, is there anything as vile or just making you feel as insecure as having your ID stolen? Some of you here may have had that experience. I'll tell you, in the United States, it's a big problem. Do you know that between 2016 and 2019, there was, oh, one in 15 Americans who had their ID digitally compromised in one way, shape, or form, that so far, over 49 million Americans have had their ID stolen, and that it's cost the country $58 billion, billion dollars. You break that down to each individual, that's over $1,100. I'm gonna tell you something. That, it, it makes me angry when I think about people who actually target you or me innocently to try to steal our very identity. It's a terrible kind of breach, isn't it? It's invasive, it's personal, nothing in our lives feels secure, but it informs us of this reality that there are outside threats in the new digital age in which we live that are always trying to steal from you what belongs to your core person. And this is literally what the man in this story had experienced, not digitally, but spiritually. We don't know much about this man. We don't even know his name, but we do know at some point in his life, everything about him had been so consumed by outside malicious forces that he no longer resembled anything like he was. He lived in tombs or amongst tombstones, amongst the graveyard. Now think about this. If you know anything about the background of the Bible, People who experience Judaism, people who follow Jewish ways and practices, they don't hang around graveyards. That's where the, un, or the dead are. That's an unclean place. This man probably survived because in this pagan environment, they would bring food and they would leave it at the tombstones as an offering to their deceased ancestors. More than that, he's cut himself, so he has blood all over him, and so he's doubly unclean. And oh, by the way, later on, you find out when Jesus actually cast the spirits out of this man, they go into what? To pigs. Do you know anything about Judaism and pigs? I mean, this is an unclean kind of place as you can imagine. And what the Bible tells us and what strikes us immediately in this, this uh, story is that the crowd had tried to chain the man, but... Because he has outside forces, he cannot be contained, he cannot be subdued, he is subhuman, he is animal-like. What more of a mockery is it to God's creation than take something so beautiful and divine and make it like an animal? And yet I would propose to you today, church, and this is a hard one for some of us, that there are some things out there in our lives and in the world in which we live that are actually telling us to live like animals, to embrace whatever makes you feel good in the moment, to embrace whatever gives you liberty. But you see, I have found that some of the things when we give ourselves over to whatever makes us feel good in the moment, it doesn't actually liberate us. It actually makes us sub- human. And so here's the reality. There are so many things out there. Listen, church, hear me. Just because something is permitted does not mean it is good for you. Just because pornography is accessible everywhere does not mean it will not destroy your marriage and change the way you view the world around you. Just because drugs are becoming more legal does not mean that they will eventually not lead you into the grave, at least addiction. Just because something like pride arrogance, rage, are not something that we see outside of us like addiction but are internal. doesn't mean that if you leave them unchecked will not turn you into something subhuman. You see, what we learn very early in this story is that you were created, listen, you were created to reflect God. We have this crazy, wacko, upside-down thing that says when there are restrictions 
that we see in the book, in the Bible, or in our Christian day-to-day life, that that's just trying to keep you away from being your true self, but I would actually advocate to you just the opposite. Anyone who's had little kids knows this, that when you raise children, when you tell them no, it is not necessarily because you want to bring them down or you want to subdue them, it's because you want to protect them. You see, for some reason, the word discipline is no longer applicable in our modern day and age, and yet what we see here is the life of a man who's been let to go to animal-like instincts, and now all of a sudden, he's not even recognizable. That's the first thing. Here's the second thing I see in the story. This man has a false strength, a false power in his life. When the story tells us they chained him, he broke them. There's been stories like that all over the world. It's crazy. It's something straight out of a movie. Let me tell you something today. Many of us, we believe that because of our title, our position, our money, our status, the degrees behind our name, we're good. But let me tell you today, church, it might be a false kind of power, a false kind of strength. We think that we are self-sufficient, so as long as we have a plan for retirement, and as long as we do these things, and as long as we pursue this education, we're going to be all good. And Listen, all those things are good. Do those things. Plan those things, but know this. Ultimately, you do not control the outcome of your destination, of your life. That is solely in the hands of God. And I think some of us, why is Christianity struggling? Not globally. Did you know this, church? Christianity around the world is exploding. Exploding. In the Western world, it's struggling. You know why? We don't need God for a whole lot of anything, do we? You're hungry, you go through the drive-thru. You get behind on a mortgage payment, you just go talk to the bank. We have so much access to so much of the things that the world does not have access to. And let me tell you something. I'm happy for those things that because of that, we have not relied on God for a whole lot of anything. And because of that, we have a false sense of security and strength. Let me tell you, church, whether you grew up in Canada, the United States, or Southeast Asia, or Africa, or Central America, it does not matter. Your destiny, the power of this universe And your ultimate purpose is found only in the hands of the living God. Here's the next thing I see. The demons, they come up to Jesus. And you'll notice immediately, they say, what do you want of us? Jesus, they use his name, son of the most high God. We look at this story and we go, wow. They're kind of respectful. They recognize Jesus, who he is, but it's not what you think is going on here. You see, they're using his name to manipulate him. This is what's going on. In the ancient world, people believed, especially in pagan areas of the world, that if you wanted to control someone or you wanted to manipulate someone through magical incantations, the first thing you needed to know was their personal name. People guarded their names personally in certain parts of the world. And so when these demons come up and they say, what's your name? They're not coming with a sense of respect. They're trying to do battle with Jesus. They're in a chess game. They know who he is, but they have this feeling that maybe, just maybe, we can kind of manipulate our way out of this. Jesus ain't having any of that. Jesus, on the other hand, you'll notice this. What does he do? Before anything else, he replies, what's your name? See, the question some of us need to hear, not from your pastor, but from Jesus himself, is what is your name? Because the name that this man gives is Legion. Legion was a military unit in Rome. 6,000 people made up a military unit. That's that's how far this man had fallen. 6,000. When Jesus says to us today, what's your name? What's the answer that comes right to your head? I'm not talking about like after you've thought, like what's the thing? Here's what so many of us have. We think of this. We think of abuse. We think the word screw up. We think the word addict. We think all these things that have over time come to define us. I'm not talking about the name on your birth certificate. I'm talking about when someone, Jesus looks at you and says, who are you? Who, are you? who do you see yourself as? The answers are painful. But we live in a very sanitized world and we sanitize our faith and we are not very transparent because we dare not let people see the inside of us. 
But notice this, church, watch this. By asking his name, it's the first step to driving the lies that had controlled him out of him once and for all. Pigs are not herd animals. These demons thought they were pretty clever. We're going to get out of this man, we're going to go to the pigs, and then we'll figure out something else to do thereafter. But because they're not herd animals, and because the demon possession into these animals causes them to go all wild, they all go into utter destruction. See, Jesus has the last laugh in this story. Let me tell you something. Jesus does not just want to give you and remind you of your true name. He wants to destroy that which is inside of you that is stealing your very identity today. And that comes when he looks at you and he says, what's your name? Here's the next thing I see, real quick. The crowds immediately ask, Jesus, get out of here. Get out of here. Now think about this, how sad. This man just performed a miracle of all miracles and imagine what he could have done in their towns if he was allowed just to speak into their lives. But because Jesus is an outsider, and they don't get him, they beg him to leave. Do not be surprised, church, as the years go on, that the world in which we live does not get who Jesus is. They do not get who you are. You may face questions and persecution, dare I even say, but that does not disauthenticate what Jesus has done or is doing in your life and wants to do through you. And here's the last thing I want to share with you. This is the beautiful part of the story. At the end of it, we find this reality. The demons make a request of Jesus, and he grants it. The townspeople make a request of Jesus, and he grants it. This man who has been healed and now sits in his right mind comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, let me follow you. And Jesus says, nope. Go to your town amongst your own people. And tell them how much Jesus has done for you. I find it very ironic that at the end of this story, when Jesus has asked this man his name, that we still don't even know what his name is. Do you ever notice that? But I don't think it matters anymore. Because by sending this man into the world to testify to what God had done in and through him, really the only thing that matters is that the name of Jesus is being proclaimed in and through him. We just saw a baptism here today. It was beautiful. When you declare, I'm a follower of Jesus, and you go into the waters, what you're saying is, it's all Jesus now. I'm not ashamed. Did you know that when we gather here today, we are reminded that when we go out into the world thereafter, you're to take Jesus with you. I'm kind of getting tired of Christian celebrity. Are you? I'm kind of getting tired of like big name pastors and theologians who make multi-million dollar contracts and they have these sneakers that are worth 500 bucks and they're writing books and they're becoming people. We almost emulate these people. You know what I hope at the end of my life people say? And I hope they say it about you. Whew, Jesus did something in their life. Jesus, Jesus did something on their life. Here's what Jesus says to you this morning. What's your name? Whatever you brought in here today, whatever name, whatever title, whatever lie you have, he wants to replace that with the name of Jesus. Because in the name of Jesus, there is real power, and there is real liberty, and there is real freedom. And in that, you may find, like this man that the name of Jesus in your life will now testify to what he has done through you and wants to do in you in the world that you go and live in every single day. When Jesus comes back later in the story, and he does come back, the Bible tells us when he crosses the lake, there are crowds waiting with there for him, with their sick, with their diseased, and he heals them. And it's caused people to go, how would this pagan area even know about Jesus? There's only one way, friends. It's because this man, who had the new name of Jesus, went and said, Jesus, it's all Jesus.
Here's how we're going to end our ser- a sermon today. In front of you, there should be a card. And uh, we've been doing this practice here at this church every single week. And it's just a way we put feet to our faith. But we encourage people, if you have a prayer request, to write them on there and bring them in here. We want you to know that we faithfully pray over every single request that is put, put in here. We push them down because it gets so far. And when you put this in, you're not only praying for this, but you're covenanting with God that you're going to lift these issues up in prayer. And this represents the answers to prayer. These are awesome because these give us tangible reminders that God is still a God who answers prayer. But we're going to do something a little different with those cards today. If you want to come and do that here in this next song, please feel free to. But I'm actually going to also encourage that you reflect over the course of this next song what your name is. What is the name you brought in here today? What is the lie you have carried? What is the issue you struggle with? What is the thing that leaves you in bondage? And what I'm going to encourage you to do is write that down and leave it at the best place possible. Because I don't want to go to a church where everything's hunky-dory. I want to go to a church where we come and we bring our burdens and we lay it at the foot of the cross where there's no reverb because you don't have a microphone on. But over the course of this next song, listen, do not leave here chained by the lies of what the enemy is saying about you. Leave it at the foot of the cross and walk away with the name of Jesus over your life. I'm going to invite the band up for one last song. Heavenly Father, as we reflect over the course of this next song, we ask in this moment that you would bring healing to us and may we do the hard, difficult work where we come and we say, Lord, this is what I believed about myself and And this is what I've carried, but I no longer want it, and I no longer accept that name over myself. But I take the healing and the liberating name of Jesus and the powerful name of Jesus. If the demons thought they could manipulate Jesus by his name, we come with grace and love, and we say we declare in the name of Jesus, we take the spiritual authority and the power that the name of Jesus brings, and we seek freedom for ourselves, but not only for ourselves, so that we can take and carry the name of Jesus to our communities. And so, Father, as we reflect and as we pray, do the healing work, and like this man, drive out and destroy those lies, which for some of us have consumed us for far too long. We ask this in the name of Jesus and the power of Jesus. Amen.